Hi there. Uh, this is a presentation of the meanings behind the Wheel of Seasons and uh, some of the thoughts that have gone into the coining of this design. Uh, my name is uh, Rooney Anna Rasmussen. I have a PhD in History of Religions from the University of Uppsala. You can patron support my work with uh, renewing our perception of Nordic history of religions with cutting edge anthropology if you want. Um, a lot of people have been asking questions about this design and the different parts of it and uh, what, what it means. And that's not so strange because uh, it's quite dense and a lot of thought and a lot of research has gone into it. Uh, also, I didn't really explain it thoroughly in the work on the calendar that was published here for 2020. So uh, in this video, I'll explain all the parts of this figure. Um, and yeah, this, this Wheel of Seasons is an attempt to condense an image of Nordic seasonal animism into one design by simply combining traditional calendar elements. And the reason uh, that this is a circular design is not just that I'm a gigantic hippie who likes circular things, <laughs> it's also that these designs actually um, occur in circular form sometimes. Uh, so uh, though this particular design is, is my coinage, it, it basically just a combination of traditional elements. Um, the idea of putting together these traditional calendar ele elements was also inspired by the way that different uh, indigenous groups today are working with exactly calendars in the way that they create uh, seasonal rounds in order as a tool to stay connected with traditional knowledge. Uh, you know, but of course the material here was already there, it was just like combining it into, into one Im image. So this uh, particular design has gone through some different stages from my first shot at climbing something together uh, and my <laughs> graphic program over the more professional design by Uwe Behrendt that was published and used in the in 2020 calendar. And uh, now we are uh, publishing Avon Nilsson's take on this design. So, uh, and, and, now, and now you can purchase it in a poster form also and uh, then you can choose an image background of some different landscape uh, photos by a, a, a guy named Ruben Tallow who's a scholar and also a member of the band Heilung. And um, well, let me go through the, the elements of, of the Wheel of Seasons here. The, the outer ring here is the, the runic calendar and I made another video about that but I'll explain it here again a little bit. <laughs> there are two lines of runes and they represent the year uh, as a cycle uh, of the sun and the cycle of the moon. The first line is called the Arstaf or Orstaf, the year staff, and it consists of seven runes that are repeated throughout the year. So in a given year each weekday will be marked by the same rune throughout the year and a year is known by its Sunday rune, the rune that marks the Sunday. And there's even this little mnemonic rhyme to remember these uh, runes. And it goes, Himlen kører rundt om tours ur gamle fader. Uh, I'm actually not sure what it, what it means or even when historically this rhyme has emerged. It might be fairly late, but it's just a, a little um, rhyme to remember what's basically just the first seven letters of the Futhark, actually in the inverse order. And so this line of runes, the or staff, it basically repeats 52 times plus one uh, these seven, these seven um, runes because a year is 52 weeks plus one day, which is also why the or staff begins and ends on the same rune, uh, which again is why you can just find the place where the F rune is repeated and that's January 1st. Right, uh, also uh, counting a solar year by a set number of weeks is actually a very old tradition. You find it specifically in medieval Iceland. Cool. Um, the next line, line of runes is the Tungelrim or the moon rhyme. And these rhymes represent the dates where the new moon can be found, uh, those dates where the new moon can be found in a given year. Uh, now the new moon in traditional agrarian society was really important because it sort of defined what was coming. It was like the potential state of what was sort of heading our way. And it would take a separate video to explain details about how these moon uh, runes work. So for here it's just to say that each year is marked by a moon rune that marks where the new moon of that year will fall throughout the year. 
right? Um, for instance, in 2020, the moon rune is Hail. And the Hail rune approximately marks the day of the new moon. So according to the old Swedish rune poem, which I've published on my Facebook page, since nobody else found this amazing really weird piece of oracular runic poetry worth any attention. Uh, <coughs> the Swedish rune poem here, it holds this little omen for each year as defined by the rune. So, uh, for instance, the omen for 2020, it goes, Hail is the hardest rain. Uh, that is the timely winter and a good harvest year. And, well, that holds true, uh, you know, until now, winter seems to have been cancelled in Northern Europe, which I actually very much do not think would count as a timely winter or a teeth winter. Um, there are uh, many indications that Scandinavians back in the day actually used to prefer their windows hard. It was as if the world was supposed to have a good marked rhythm between a good strong winter and a good strong summer, which of course was the foundation of agrarian life. People sort of needed that sort of uh, mirroring somehow. Um, yeah, perhaps another token that uh, climate change has uh, completely set our world out of joint. The fact that the Swedish runic poem actually seemed to be off here for 2020. So yeah, this is uh, the runic calendar and the moon rune here is the, is the, uh, the tungal ream. That is the important bit and the, the difficult part, the, this second line of rune here. And uh, the Swedes, the wonderful and weird and thoughtful Swedish people, without whom this amazing stuff hadn't really survived. Uh, the Swedes, Swedes, they also have, have given us a little mnemonic uh, poem to remember the moon runes. Uh, and I wanted to mention it here, but I gave up <laughs> because it's so weird. Uh, I, I might uh, publish it in its own right one day in a, in a separate post or a video or something. Um, also, the precision of these moon runes actually fluctuates a bit down through the century. Uh, centuries. This moon system, it falls off one day on 304 years. <laughs> so if you just pick up a medieval rune staff, then it won't work. It won't actually represent the moon faces of today. You need to have a contemporary runic staff or runic calendar. And I'm also flipping lucky that I've actually found an astronomer, a contemporary astronomer, who has actually made a contemporary precise runic calendar. Uh, and that is the uh, traditional rune row fitted to uh, represent the contemporary moon phases, uh, the one represented here. Right, the next line is the primstavs, and primstavs are these traditional Norwegian calendars. They're also found in other parts of Scandinavia, but they're typically Norwegian. Uh, and the holidays around the year are marked by these primstavs. Right. So in this calendar, uh, we use these uh, primstav to mark both the fixed and the mobile dates. Like Christmas, for instance, is, is constant. It's, not, it's on the same day every year. But Easter follows a specific rule that makes it move back and forth. Right. Um, and, and that's the same with holidays uh, linked to Nordic animism. Some will just stay on the same date, like May Day is on the 1st of May. Right. Uh, but some will move. Like, for instance, the Yule moon, the date of the pre-Christian heathen Yule. That's the first full moon after the first new moon after the winter solstice. That date will move uh, from year to year, right? So uh, traditional Primstaff calendars, they didn't have this lunar system, uh, but I wanted the Primstaffs to represent all the different dates, right? Because basically, uh, you know, to make it possible to operate the calendar, right? The, the purpose of Primstaff is to have a mark on your calendar when there is a holiday. So what I've done is that, that I've, I've taken dates, those dates that move, and then I've taken Primstaff, Primstaffs with closely related symbolisms, right? And, and used them. So there's symbols also marking the, the mobile holidays. For instance, the uh, German Hulda, whose night is the last Thursday before Christmas, that's a mobile date. So she doesn't have a prime staff. Also, it's, it's a German holiday, right? So what to do? Well, Hulda is a part of a complex of female figures that are characteristic of, of, of Yule, the Yule period, also in Scandinavia, which was sort of dominated by these dangerous winter goddesses type figure, uh, often associated with spinning, and this caused uh, tattoo, taboos on spinning, which in Norway um, was also associated with the Norwegian holiday Karimas, which was marked by a wheel. So I used this wheel also to mark Hulda's night. It's a very closely related symbolic meaning. Um, 
Also, I, I cho chose these Primstaff symbols by looking at different Primstaff calendars. And there are these uh, collection act collections, actually, of Norwegian Primstaff symbols. For instance, there are ones that are made by a, a scholar called Kåre Hovin. Uh, and when you look at them, then well, you can choose between them. And uh, I've chosen the ones that I, I, th I think have sort of an, an animist feel or meaning to them somehow. Uh, an example here is the High Summer Mark. Uh, and the the, uh, the candle mass, the February second, which in, in Ireland is close to Saint Bridget or Imbolc, uh, and there are many different op options for, the, for these dates because there are many different possible staffs, and each prime staff had was different, so there are hundreds of different marks, uh, and uh, these are uh, prime staff marks uh, recorded by Kor Hovind for the candle mass on the Norwegian prime staffs. So for these two days. Uh, at, at the opposite end of the year, uh, I could have chosen little crosses with lilies or candlesticks or bishop stuffs and all kinds of stuff, but I chose these two figures. I think they're beautiful, like solar like symbols that seem to somehow mirror each other. They, they, uh, they speak somehow to the cycle of the sun in these extreme ends of the year, the high summer and the midwinter. And uh, these are primarily, primarily uh, Norwegian prime stuffs. But they aren't all of them uh, from Norway. I've given a little tip of the hat to the one Danish prime staff that's known by using um, uh, uh, its symbol, a uh, symbol from that one, to mark the important Disting, uh, a, a kind of a goddess uh, celebration, uh, pre-Christian goddess celebration of, of the spring. Uh, and also there, there are some symbols from the traditional Swedish almanac uh, that, uh, that has this monumental way of symbolizing the Yule period, for instance. It, it, it's ma made as like a line of horns. It, they're horns marking different holidays all around Yule. So we get Yule is represented by this line of horns. Uh, and that's, this is deeply meaningful when you understand what Yule is and has been through history and sort of the, the animist meanings connected to Yule. And, um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not a great believer in the idea of the culture as this somehow nature-given, consistent unit of human practice, which is perhaps limited of language or something like that. I, in my view, that's a little bit of a myth. Um, for instance, the Sami and the Norse have shared a lot of culture all the way back to like the Viking Age, where you sometimes find Sami people in Viking graves or involved in the Landnam, the settling of Iceland, or myths where the Norwegian kings try to tie their bloodline into descent from the Sami. Uh, so I've even included some uh, examples, a couple of examples of Sami prime staffs in some cases here. Right. Uh, the last circles here in the, in the center, they are traditional templates that are often part of calendar staffs, uh, and they basically show how to read them. The first line shows the golden numbers, those runes that mark the uh, date where you can expect uh, to find the, the new moon. Uh, and, and this line is there basically to show the user of a calendar what shapes of the runes you, you should expect to find. Um, the next one here is a, is a key uh, or a template to show the Sunday runes of a given year. And uh, you'll notice that some of these runes are uh, extended into double runes. And why is that? Well, the reason is the leap year. Um, and the reason that there will be two Sunday runes on a leap year is that the leap day falls outside the runic calendar. But of course, it's still a weekday, right? So after the leap day, the runes that mark the weekdays have skipped a notch, right? The Sunday rune will also skip a step. Uh, and this is a good year to illustrate this because it's actually a leap year here in 2020. Uh, and that means that, that there is an extra day is inserted in the calendar in the uh, end of February. This is uh, February 24. And uh, so if you look at the Nordic Animus calendar for 2020, you'll note that this day is empty. There isn't runes on it. It's outside the runic calendar. The runes that mark the Sunday and all the other day has, uh, has shift, shifted one space, right? Uh, and this is why we have two Sunday runes in, 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 uh, in a leap year such as uh, 2020. The Oz rune that marks the Sunday until 20, uh, February 24, and after that is the Ride rune that marks Sundays throughout, uh, throughout the year. 
And uh, here in the center, there's a cosmogram symbolizing the tree as uh, an organically related reality, as both linked to everything, but also at the center, perhaps the turning of time, the organizing principle of the, uh, uh, of the world tree. Perhaps in this case, we can see the world tree as an image of Mundilfari, and, and, uh, which is kind of an enigmatic figure that has been in, interpreted as related to the world axis and the father of time, really. The, um, the Eric poem, the Vavdrudnias Mal, names this Mundilfari as the father of the sun and the moon. And the root of this name, Mundilfari, may associate with the, the notion uh, of an axis that stuff is turning around somehow. Uh, the, yeah, the responsible principle behind the turning of time. Well, I hope that this didn't just make this even more uh, confusing than it already was. Um, when I started on working on this, uh, I was partly driven by a touch of irritation, perhaps that that all these wheels of season that you, season that you see people make make you know they're so synthetically symmetrical and well organized. And I really thought like no, I'll, I'll try to coin our design by basically moving into one graphic shape some of the actual basic elements of traditional reckoning. And that will show basically the traditional conception of time in all its messy and organic complexity, but also I think in its, its beauty and its, its power somehow. And um, yeah, that's all. Uh, as mentioned, you can uh, purchase prints of the Nordic Wheel of Seasons by finding this page. And uh, don't forget to share, like, patron, support my work, subscribe to my YouTube channel, my Facebook, and uh, give somebody a hug. Cool? See you around. <laughs>